Hi friends, welcome back. This version of AskNet, where you can ask me anything, I am answering the most common question I am getting asked at this moment. What about coronavirus if I'm trying to get pregnant? What does it mean for my fertility and my pregnancy? What does it mean if I'm undergoing treatment? What does it mean? I'm answering the questions with the limited research we know right now. Hi friends, welcome back. I'm here to talk to you today about coronavirus. This is because the COVID-19 virus is proving to be a very significant pathogen. And what we're seeing is the WHO, the World Health Organization, has declared this a pandemic. We know that this is going to be significant for our country right now, and that measures to stop population control probably have been limited. And so today I'm answering for my ASNAT series, one of the most common questions that I'm talking about day in and day out right now, what does this mean for me if I'm trying to get pregnant? Can I get pregnant? Is it safe? What if I am pregnant? What if I'm doing IVF? Tell me more. Importantly, today is March 12th and it is 1.30 in the afternoon. I'm telling you that because it is important. Things are constantly changing and evolving. And if you listen to this in a week, something new may have come out. And so these recommendations may not be accurate, but they are the most up-to-date that we currently have. And I'm just gonna share with you my take. Those of you who don't know, I'm a fertility physician. So I am a board certified OBGYN and a board certified reproductive endocrinologist and infertility physician. I work at an IVF clinic. We're here in Austin, Texas, where we have zero confirmed cases right now. That doesn't mean we're gonna stay at zero. It likely means it's in our community and just not yet been diagnosed. I can speak personally and from what I hear from my physicians in the community that testing is a problem and it is hard to test all people who you want to. I think that's huge and important for us to realize because if we can't truly capture the people who have the disease, we one, can't truly quarantine them, and number two, we can't fully understand the impact. We are skewing the curve if we're only diagnosing people who we think have the disease already based on their symptoms or exposures. So number one, there are limitations to all the data we have. This is a novel virus, that means new, and we don't have prior research or prior immunity to it. If you've been told before that the flu vaccine is gonna protect you, that's false. There's no reason to support that. It also means that new data is coming out currently. And for those of us who are in the field of fertility, we don't necessarily have the best answers for all of our patients. And we are playing at that stake. I think what most of us know by now is that the symptoms mirror that of a cold or a mild flu, fever, cough, runny nose, respiratory difficulties, shortness of breath. You can also have GI symptoms like diarrhea. Children have milder symptoms than some high-risk adults. And so children may potentially be vectors. Control measures include washing your hands and limiting contact with others. So limiting travel, cleaning surfaces, not touching your hands to your face and being really careful on those measures. And also patients who are older, people who are potentially immunocompromised or high risk need to be extra careful. What does that mean for us? Let's be really clear. Pregnant women are always considered a high-risk group. That's because you're immunocompromised in a state of pregnancy, and that immunocompromise often can predispose you to other things. So when we look at prior illnesses like H1N1, um, we would see that, or SARS or MERS, that there would be higher risks of infection. Pregnant women would have higher mortality or higher risk of dying from the disease than somebody who was not pregnant. So we always consider pregnant women in our highest risk group. What am I currently recommending for my high-risk patients? That they don't travel, that they take proper precautions, they avoid public spaces when they can, they wash their hands, disinfect surfaces, and they're very cautious at this current time. I'm grouping them into the highest risk category. Notably, there's limited data. There have been some studies from China, which was the original epicenter of this, showing that women who were pregnant in the third trimester when they contracted the virus, that they did not pass it on to their children. So that the children tested negative if the mom was positive and that the virus was not in amniotic fluid or breast milk. And I think that's important because that shows that there is less likely to be maternal to fetal, mom to baby 
transmission. That would be a very good thing for us. Some other viruses that we know do have maternal to fetal transmission like Zika, of course it's a very different virus, but that can infect the placenta and the baby and cause birth defects. We don't have good first trimester data right now, and I think that's crucially important for my patients trying to get pregnant. First trimester of pregnancy, you have to gestate. These women in China who were exposed in their first trimester, they're not even to anatomy scan. They're not even to the point of their pregnancy where they've had a birth yet. That's going to take months and months, if not a year, to compile all of this data. There have not been reports of birth defects associated with the virus. I think what can helps us feel more reassured is the virus is similar to SARS and MERS. Those, in fact, were not associated with birth defects. However, there was an association with miscarriage or stillbirth risk if the mom got ill, and that may in fact be true, we do not know. So I'm telling my pregnant patients that they are high risk, or if you're going to get pregnant, that we wanna make sure you're taking all precautions against getting the disease that you can. High fever in early pregnancy has always been potentially teratogenic. That means holds the risk of birth defects. So you need to be prepared to self-quarantine yourself, work from home, do whatever you can if you're early pregnant or trying to get pregnant undergoing fertility treatments. And I think that's really important for us to understand. When we are living in the world of limited data, we must be conservative. I am hopeful that there's no association with birth defects. I'm really hopeful of that. And I think that's likely what we'll see, but what I think and what I hope for is not scientific evidence. The truth is we do not have evidence right now to support it. So if you are pregnant, you need to consider yourself in the highest risk category and you need to take listen to these warnings. If you're trying to get pregnant, you need to make sure that once you do in fact get pregnant, you try to limit exposure so that you do not get the disease in the first trimester, so you don't get high fevers and potentially have a higher risk for miscarriage or birth defects associated with the fever more than the virus itself. When it comes to fertility treatments, we are not canceling cycles, so we don't have any reason to believe that this virus is impacting egg quality or sperm quality at the current moment. We are proceeding with IVF and we are proceeding with cycles to freeze eggs. I am not telling my patients to stop at any time. However, I am warning them that their cycle may in fact be canceled if they test positive because we don't want to be exposing that positive person to all of our staff and to the other patients. So if you are undergoing fertility treatments, I think you need to understand what your clinic's policy is. What if you get the virus? What does that mean? You probably need to self-quarantine, then your cycle is canceled. We're also not delaying transfers at the current time. We're just talking through the risks in early pregnancy like I just did for you. I can't guarantee that'll always be the case. New data may come out next month, next week, tomorrow that may make me feel differently about that. But right now, we are proceeding like normal. Patients are still having IVF cycles, still having embryo transfer cycles. We are working on our clinic policy to make sure that we have enough staff to stop all of these things. And I think if you're a fertility patient, that's a fabulous question to ask your clinic. What are you doing in case all your staff members goes out? Is there a plan? Are you limiting who's coming into the office? How are you trying to protect the situation? I view fertility on a spectrum, meaning it is here for a moment, it is not guaranteed. There's absolutely zero data at all to talk about future fertility after getting the virus. We do know that there are some viruses that impact your ability to get pregnant later. So I think a good example is mumps. If you get mumps, then you're a man, you can go into testicular failure afterward and not make sperm anymore. And so there's not any data on if that's the case with COVID-19 right now. And so we have to proceed with caution. I don't think it's right to then withhold fertility treatments to patients when we have a virus out that we have no data on if it potentially impacts fertility or not. So we're not canceling cycles, but we're making backup plans for our clinic policies. We're not canceling transfers either. We're just being aware. We are limiting travel. We're screening patients, trying to make sure that if you're sick for any reason that you're not coming in, we have a very low threshold to cancel cycles for patients. It does appear that children are getting the disease less severely than adults, but it doesn't mean that they're not getting it at all. In fact, the New England Journal of Medicine published a study today showing a case report of the cases of children out of China. And there were six children they talked about ages 3 to 10 who all in fact got the disease, were hospitalized between 5 to 13 days, and one of them was even placed on a ventilator. They all recovered. None of them died. They needed supplemental treatment. That being said, I don't want us to run around thinking that this is a disease that doesn't impact children. We do think most of them will be mild, but it's not that they are completely excluded. 
It also doesn't mean that young adults or adults in my age range can't get the disease either. So I think we're a little misguided by media thinking that this is only a disease that's impacting the older population. A little bit of fear, we don't need panic, but a little bit of fear to make us take these warnings that the CDC and the World Health Organization are putting out there and take them seriously is not a bad thing. Meaning, wash your hands, don't touch your face, disinfect your surfaces, cancel what you can, don't put yourself in public places, try to limit non-essential exposure, limit going to concerts and conferences and big meetings, limit travel, have a plan in place where you work, have a plan in place if you're undergoing fertility treatment so you understand when your cycle may or may not be canceled and what the alternative options are. I promise you that those of us who are on this side of medicine are taking this very seriously. We are just as concerned about the pandemic as we are about the panic. We wanna make sure that you are being taken care of. It, I am not recommending that patients stuck efforts to try to have a baby at this time. I don't think there's any data to support that. I think in times of distress, life must go on, but we also must be more careful about how it goes on. So be paying a lot of attention to the world around us and to the things we are doing and exposing ourselves to. That is highly important at this time. So I want you all to know that I take this seriously and we all do. We all want the best for you and for your family. Please take it seriously as well. And please don't put others at risk just because you think that you are immune or this won't impact your life. This is going to impact all of our lives. There's no need to panic, but there is a need for us to have awareness and to be smart about the choices that we're making for ourselves and for our family. Please feel free to ask any questions. I'm happy to answer with anything that I know. Obviously, this is a currently ongoing situation. I recommend you follow the CDC and the World Health Organization to stay up to date and ask your own fertility clinic if you're a fertility patient what this means for you and your exact situation. Thank you guys so much for listening. Follow along.